Hi everyone, we're now going to look at chapter 7 and it's actually broken into two parts because it's just so long. <laughs> so we're going to do the first half of the lecture which focuses on cash and accounts receivables. Um, and then the second part of the lecture will focus on notes receivables, uh, sale of receivables, and some unique um, uh, activities that could happen with receivables. So here's what we're going to be looking at first is cash. And remember, cash is the amount that is available to pay off debts or use an operation. So it's our currency and coins, balances, and checking accounts. Remember, we also have cash equivalents, which are short-term, highly liquid investments that are readily convertible to cash with little risk of loss. The maturity date is no longer than three months from the date of purchase. Money market funds, treasury bills, and commercial paper are common cash equivalents. So you're focused on when is it due from the date of purchase. If it's within three months, it's a cash equivalent. Companies must report information about cash and cash equivalents um, in their summary of major accounting policies. And here's an example of Walgreen uh, Boots Alliance, how they describe what's in their cash and cash equivalents. So there is a note to the financial statement. So that's pretty much cash, right? Um, we know when we start talking about our assets, especially cash, we worry a lot about internal control. Sarbanes-Oxley has made it mandatory that companies who are publicly um, audited um, that meet certain circumstance must have not only an audit report on their financial statements, but also the internal control structure of the company. So internal control is there to encourage adherence to company policies, promote operational efficiency, minimize errors and thefts, and enhance the reliability and accuracy of accounting data. So there's our Sarbanes-Oxley requirement. Um, a company must document its internal controls, so, so basically all the things they do to protect themselves and make sure that they're going to protect them, assess their adequacy, and auditors express an opinion on management's assessment. The Committee of Sponsoring Organization, COSO, has defined internal control as a process to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives in effectiveness and efficiency of operations, reliability of financial reporting, and compliance with laws and regulations. So this isn't, um, you know, this is mandatory for public companies especially. But not only that, for any company, why wouldn't you want to operate efficiently? Why wouldn't you want to protect the company as best you can, especially the assets? So this is an exercise all companies should be undertaking. When it comes to internal control procedures, that's where we focus the most time on. Is there a separation of duties when dealing with cash receipts? So here's the prime example, and I've seen this in action. Um, I used to audit the United Way of Wyoming Valley 25 years ago, and they actually had employees who did this because they have such a huge amount of mail coming in during their fundraising time. Employee A opens the mail each day and prepares a multi-copy listing of all checks, including the amount and payer's name. Actually, they had two. Employee B takes the check along with one copy of the listing to the person responsible for depositing the checks in the company's bank account. A second copy of the check listing is sent to the accounting department where employee C enters receipts into the accounting records. Okay, so and when the deposit is made, eventually that is matched up with the original documentation from the mailroom. Here's some internal control procedures with cash disbursement, so the other side of cash. Um, they're done to prevent unauthorized payments and to ensure disbursements are properly recorded. So all disbursements should be made by check and authorized, and checks should only be signed by authorized individuals, and they shouldn't be the same person who authorizes the payment and signs the check. So which of the following is not an element of good internal control system for cash receipts and disbursements? Well, maintaining a separation of duties is definitely 
ensuring checks are signed by authorized individuals, definitely. Having the most senior employee handle cash disbursements and bank reconciliations. No. No. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't matter who's doing it, as long as there's a separation of duties and it's being done properly. Now, moving on with cash. Sometimes cash is restricted for certain purposes, like a future plant expansion. Um, or something that's contractually imposed. So the, a debt, a loan agreement may require the company to set money aside. So if the debt is a non-current debt and the money they set aside will be reported as a non-current restricted cash asset, usually in the long-term investment area. If the debt that is requiring these setting aside of cash or restricted cash is a sh short term or current, then it will be listed as restricted cash in the current asset section. The point is, is not included with your normal cash, it's restricted. And depending on what it's restricted for, will determine if it's a current asset or a long term investment asset. Also relating to cash, compensating balances. This is an amount that compensates the bank for granting the loan or extending the company a line of credit. So with the, under this arrangement, the borrower is asked to maintain a specified balance in a low interest or non-interest bearing account at the bank because they have some type of loan with the bank. The required balance equals usually some percentage of the committed amount and the borrow pay, borrower pays interest rate higher than the stated rate on the debt. Okay, so this is an amount basically that needs to stay in the bank at all times. A company borrows 10 million from a bank at an interest rate of 12%. The bank requires a non or requires a compensating balance of 2 million to be held in a non-interest bearing checking account. So, the bank borrows or I'm sorry, the company borrows 10 million, the interest charged on it is 1.2 million. How much are they actually borrowing though? 8 million because they need to keep 2 million of it in the bank. So what's their actual interest they're paying? Well, they're paying interest on the total loan at 12%, but what is the total loan? 8 million. So 1.2, the interest divided by the 8 million, that's the actual amount of the loan because they can't use the other 2 million. Their interest rate is 15% on that loan. Wow. And 15%, the effective rate is greater than 12%, the stated rate on the loan. Jenks borrowed 13 million from a bank at a 10% rate of interest. The bank requires Jenks to maintain a $3 million compensating balance. What is Jenks effective interest rate? Well, the interest on this loan would be 1.3 million. How much did he actually borrow? 10 million, because he's required to keep 3 million in the bank. So 1.3 million divided by 10 million, 13% is his interest rate. And there it is. Okay, so make sure you can work through that and ask any questions you may have. When it comes to U.S. versus IFRS, I know I don't focus a lot on IFRS, but I should. So here we go. U.S. GAAP. Sometimes overdrafts, well, not sometimes, overdrafts on a bank account. So if the company writes out checks for more than the balance in the checking account, that will create a negative balance in the checking account. Well, U.S. GAAP says, don't show a negative balance in your checking account. The negative balance should be shown as a liability because you're not going to pay those. You don't have the money. That's a liability. You still owe them. IFRS allows these overdrafts to be offset against other cash accounts. Now, there is a little thing, so you know, 
that if there is a cash account in US GAAP, if there is another cash account at the same bank where you have the overdraft, you can net them. Okay, but IFRS lets you do it against any other cash account. US GAAP requires assets and liabilities to be stated separately on a balance sheet. IFRS liabilities can be offset against other cash accounts and stated at their net value on the balance sheet. So a little bit of a different type of reporting. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. I'm going to keep going. That's cash. You know, we don't spend a huge amount of time on cash because cash is cash. But we want to make sure we understand cash equivalent, compensating balances, and that effective interest rate when we're required to keep a compensating balance. And the internal controls related to our cash account. Now we're going to move on to accounts receivable. Remember, accounts receivables um, are where we keep track of amounts the customers owe to the company, usually with a sale. Most businesses provide credit to their customers. Now, accounts receivables are more of an informal verbal credit arrangement supported by an invoice so there is something in writing that normally says it's due 30 to 60 days after the sale please remember that accounts receivable generally does not charge an interest on the balances they're classified as current because their normal collection period is within the same operating cycle or the next operating cycle so how do we value accounts receivables well, sellers recognize an amount of revenue equal to the amount they are entitled to receive in exchange for satisfying a performance obligation. So they provide a service, they provide a product. Sellers allocate the transaction price to the various performance obligations when ser service obligations are performed. Well, that's great, okay? What we want to know about is how much should the accounts receivable be? There's some potential complexities, time value of money and variable consideration. Excuse me one second. Um, okay. So part of um, our accounts receivable can be influenced by discounts. Now there's two major types of discounts in the business world, trade discounts. A trade discount is not formally recorded in an accounting system. What is it? Usually a company will offer a product at a certain price. They call it a list price, but they will offer a quantity discount if you buy over a certain amount of items. That's a trade discount. Sales discounts are cash discounts for paying a bill early. So they're intended to provide incentive for quick payments. So we'll see them listed. It's not two over 10 and over 30. It's usually two slash 10 and slash 30, which the first number is a discount the second number is the number of days of, for the discount. So if you pay your bill in the first 10 days, customer, take a 2% cash discount. We call these sales discounts. Otherwise, pay the full amount by the 30th day from the sale. Okay, so take a look. We have two different ways we could record a receivable when there is a cash or a sales discount. Hawthorne Manufacturing Office offers credit customers a 2% sales discount if the sales price is paid within 10 days. Any amounts not paid within 10 days are due in 30 days. These repayment terms are stated as 2 slash 10, so 2% discount if paid in the first 10 days, and slash 30, full amount due by the 30th day. On October 5th, Hawthorne sold merchandise at a price of $20,000. The customer paid $13,720 on October 14th because they paid within the discount period. 
on that part of the purchase. They paid the remaining 6000 out of the discount period on November 4th. Now you see at the top it says gross method versus net method. When we are recording a sale which has a sales discount, we have a choice of how we record it. We can record it as the gross method. So what that means is list how much is owed. Debit accounts receivable for the full amount, credit sales revenue for the full amount. We also have the net method. The met nef method says, assume the customer will take the discount and record the net amount of the discount as an accounts receivable. So if you take 2% of 20,000, that's 400. So if the customer pays within the discount period, they're only going to pay 19,600. So the net method says, assume that's going to happen. Debit accounts receivable, 19,600. Credit sales revenue, 19,600. So you can choose either way when you're recording a sale. Now here's what happens afterwards. If the customer pays within the discount period and you use the gross method, you must credit accounts receivable for the amount they are paying off. Remember in our discussion here, they paid off 14,000 of the 20,000 they owed within the discount period. So credit accounts receivable for that full 14,000. But they don't have to pay the full 14,000. They could take a 2% sales discount. So we will debit the contra sales revenue account, sales discounts, for the amount of discount, 14,000 times 2%, $280. The remaining will be the cash, because that's how much cash we'll actually receive, 13,720. So under the gross method, we assume the customer doesn't take the discount, and if they do, we store the discount in a contra sales revenue account. Under the net method, when we originally recorded the sale, we assumed this would happen. So we just debit cash for the amount received and credit accounts receivable. Now, what about payments outside of the discount period? Well, under the gross method, since we reported the accounts receivable at the full amount, we'll credit accounts receivable for the full 6,000 and debit cash. But under the net method, remember, we assumed that this customer would pay their full bill in the discount period. They didn't. They're going to have to pay us the $6,000 cash, but we can't credit accounts receivable for $6,000. We have to credit it for the $6,000 minus 2% discount because that's all we debited it for. So 2% of six grand is 120 debit accounts or credit accounts receivable for 58.80. We credit an other revenue and expense account called sales discounts forfeited, and it would appear on our income statement in the other other section where interest revenue and dividend revenue appear, because this is a sales discount that was forfeited. So it's really like income to the company. So you have that choice when you're recording an accounts receivable. In the end, okay, this the uh, sales revenue will be 19,720, no matter which method you use. Which of the following is not true about recording sales discounts? The gross, the gross method records sales discounts taken when payment occurs. Well, that's true. The net method records sales discounts not taken as sales discounts forfeited. That's true. Net sales revenue is higher under the gross method than under the net method. Well, no, that's not true. We just saw that. Net sales revenue is the same under both methods. So C is our answer. Okay,
Okay, I'm just going to move along. You can read through this slide. I'm going to move along to this. This is important, but it's not super important. <laughs> I want to go into sales returns. Merchandise is returned for a refund or for credit to be applied to other purchases. Okay, special price reduction is an allowance. So customers can either return the merchandise or and, and it asks for a refund or a reduction on how much they owe, but physically bring back the product, or they can ask for the company to just reduce the price of the product and the customer will keep the merchandise. That's an allowance. Accrue sales returns and allowances at the time of sale. So otherwise, recognizing sales returns when they occur could result in overstated income in the period of sale and understated income in the return period. And this just really um, became effective in the last couple of years when, a new, when the new revenue recognition um, standard was released. And it says this, estimate your returns. So accrue for them now. Don't wait until they actually come back. Your sale was reported this accounting period. So what it's saying is at the end of the period, you should look at your sales and see how much of those will probably be returned. You're going to estimate for those and you're going to return, re record them as sales returns, not when they actually happen, but this period when you recorded the sale, this will better reflect sales revenue, it won't overstate your income this accounting period, and it won't understate it next accounting period. Because if you wait till next accounting period to record a return, it's going to reduce your sales revenue next accounting period, and it has nothing to do with the sales from that accounting period. Okay, so this is merchandise sold to customer for 10000 in December to 2021. The merchandise cost six grand. The company would recognize 4,000 of gross profit in 2021. In 2022, next year, all the merchandise is returned. Huh, all of it. Well, that gross profit was too much in 2021. We would have to record the return in 2022, and then it would understate our profit in 2022. So that's just showing you a little picture so you could picture it more, see it better, right? So during 2021, its first year of operations, the Hawthorne Manufacturing Company sold merchandise for $2 million cash. This merchandise cost Hawthorne 1.2 million or 60% of the selling price. Industry experience indicates that 10% of all sales will be returned, which equals 200,000. In this case, okay, customers returned 130,000 of sales during 2021. Hawthorne uses a perpetual inventory system. So let's see how this estimating works. The sales of 2 million will be recorded, debit cash, assuming they were for cash, oh, it says it was, and credit sales revenue. Okay, debit COGS or cost of goods sold credit inventory for the cost of those items. Okay, yeah, you're gonna record the sale and remove the inventory. That actually occurred. During 2021, the company had returns. So they debit sales returns 130,000 and credit cash, because they actually occurred. They will also debit the inventory for 60% of the 130,000 because the cost of the inventory is 60% of selling price and credit cost of goods sold because those items are no longer sold, they're back. At the end of the year, they're going to say, okay, how much in returns do we expect to have on all of our stuff? Well, there's $2 million, 10% normally returns or $200,000. 130 of sales value has already been returned. So we must take that other 70 grand of our estimate, recognize it as a sales return now. So at the end of the year, we make an adjusting journal entry, debit sales returns for the other 70,000, and we credit a liability called refund liability. 
because as of the end of the year, we're, we owe that. We don't debit inventory because we didn't get anything back. Instead, we debit another asset account called inventory estimated returns. So we keep it separate. 60% of that $70,000 value. And we credit directly cost of goods sold. Because we're doing that, we're getting all the ramifications of returns recorded in the year of the sale or to the best of our ability. And that's why we do it. Now what happens next year when um, returns are coming in? So if the estimate of future sales returns turns out to be wrong, the new estimate is incorporated into accounting determinations in the next period. So suppose that in 2022, actual returns from the sales are only 60,000. Okay, what would have happened? to that 60,000. Well, here's what would have happened. They don't show this journal entry, but you could jot it down. We would debit refund liability, that liability we sent up at the end of last year for the 60,000, because now we're paying that. And we would credit cash or accounts receivable for the value of the items that the customers returned. We would debit inventory for the 60% of 60 grand or 36,000 and credit inventory estimated returns for 36,000. Now what this is saying is, well, at the end of the year, these accounts have balances. So what it's saying is reverse the remaining balance out. So the remaining balance, and you can make T accounts, make a T account for refund liability. It was credited for 70,000 at the end of 2021. 2022, 60,000 was debited to that account. So there's a $10,000 credit balance. Debit refund liability, credit sales returns. The same thing with that inventory estimated returns. It started with a debit balance of 42,000 because of the actual returns in the next year, it was credited for 36,000. So we're gonna credit it for the remaining $6,000 balance and debit cost of goods sold. $5 stores sells merchandise for cash. It began 2021 with a refund liability of zero, made sales of a million during 2021, which cost 600,000. It estimates that 1% of all sales will be returned and they've already had 8,000 of returns during 2021. When accruing its estimate of remaining returns at the end of the year, FDS would debit sales returns and credit the refund liability. We'll make a T account. Okay, so what it's saying is that it has sales of a million. So I'm just gonna write this above. 1% of them, or $10,000, is the total amount they expect to be returned. Okay, I guess we didn't really need a T account. Of that 10,000, 8,000 has already been returned. So we need to debit sales returns and allowances and credit the refund liability for the remaining 2,000. And there is a calculation. $5 FDS sells merchandise for cash, began 2021 with the liability of zero, made sales of a million, 600,000 cost, 1% of all sales will be returned and they've already experienced eight grand returned. When it's accruing its estimate of remaining returns, what will be the debit to inventory estimated returns and credit to cost of goods sold? Well, remember the sale value we need to accrue for is two grand. 60% would be considered costs. So 60% of 2,000 or 1,200 would be that dollar amount of the journal entry. So there's the accrual at the end of the year. Debit sales returns, credit refund liability to accrue for the remaining expected returns. Don't debit inventory, but a separate T account, inventory estimated returns and credit cost of goods sold. We've now 
made sure any gross profit related to what we still expect to come back has been removed and decreases gross profit this year when the sales occurred. How do we know? Sales returns reduces um, gross profit. Cost of goods sold credit will increase gross profit. Think about how those accounts affect income. All right. Woo. So now the second part of accounts receivables. Remember, just because we have accounts receivables does not mean we're going to collect our money. And bad debts are an inherent cost of granting credit. We may feel these people will pay us back, but even bad things happen to good people and, and good customers. So there's no guarantee. So we need to deal with um, the bad debts. We are not allowed to use the direct write-off method for GAAP. We use it for taxes, but not for GAAP. And the direct write-off method says, don't record a journal entry related to bad debts until it actually happens. But the allowance method says, no, don't wait till it actually happens. If you think there's going to be bad debts in the future, which there's going to be, from this year's activity, you need to estimate for that now and record that as an expense in this accounting year, not when it actually happens. So again, the direct write-off uh, method says you wait till an account is deemed to be uncollectible and that's when you make any journal entries related to it. Um, this can overstate accounts receivable and understate our expenses because we're waiting until an account actually becomes bad. That could be next year or the year after. And that's normally the journal entry you make when an account actually becomes bad under the direct write-off method. The allowance method says no doing that. It's required by GAAP whenever the amount of bad debts is material. So companies use a special account contra asset account called the allowance for uncollectible accounts or you'll hear it referred to the allowance for doubtful accounts or bad debts. They all mean the same thing. What is in that account? The amount of accounts receivable the company doesn't think they're going to collect. Now I don't want you to think we sit with a list of our customers and start ticking them off going not going to pay Eh, yeah, probably we'll pay. No, because we're not. They're not going to pay. We wouldn't sell to them on credit if we didn't think they were going to pay us. So we look at this method and estimate on a very global level, like we did with sales returns. How much overall don't we think we're going to collect? And that's based on past experience. Everybody has bad debt. It is what it is. I've never seen a company collect 100% of their accounts receivables. And when we report accounts receivables on our balance sheet, we subtract the amount in that contra asset, the allowance for uncollectible accounts. So let's see it in action. Oh, well, there it is on the balance sheet. So when you, and you saw this in chapter three, we list accounts receivable, less the allowance for doubtful or uncollectible accounts and the dollar amount. And it's the net or net realizable value accounts receivable minus the allowance for doubtful accounts that is reported on the balance sheet. Bad debt expense is not debited when specific accounts are written off. It's only debited when we're estimating. So bad debt expense is always recognized before the account actually is bad. So that's the only time you will use the bad debt expense account is when you're estimating. When a specific account receivable is deemed actually uncollectible, you debit the allowance account for that specific um, number and credit accounts receivable. 
So here we have Hawthorne Manufacturing started operations in 2021. You could see there it had sales of 1.2 million on credit, so their accounts receivable increased 1.2 million, and they collected 895,000 of them. So that's their credit. See the T account on the credit side? That's the collections. So the difference is the balance of the account, which is 305,000. Now it's at the end of the year or when we're doing a balance sheet, we need to worry about estimating for bad debts. So this is an adjusting entry. So how do we recognize um, the allowance for uncollectible accounts? Well, Hawthorne's analysis indicates it expects to collect 280,000 of its accounts receivable. So it must establish an allowance for uncollectible accounts of 25,000. So of the balance that they have, 305, they only expect to collect 280,000. So they expect 25,000 of their accounts receivables to not be collected in the future. This year, when the sale occurred, they debit bad debt expense 25,000 and credit the contra asset allowance for uncollectible accounts. Take a quick look at Green Valley Steel had sales of, 11, of 1 million on account. So if you did a T account, 1 million on the debit side and collected 760,000 on the credit side of accounts receivable. So accounts receivable has a balance of 240,000. They expect to only collect 200,000 of it. So they're going to debit bad debt expense and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts for the difference of $40,000? Answer B. And there is the calculation. And there's the journal entry. What happens when they have an actual bad account? So remember, at the end of the year, they were just estimating now, April 24th, Hawthorne concludes it will not collect a $15,000 accounts receivable. Well, now they credit accounts receivable for the $15,000. It's an actual bad account. Debit the allowance for uncollectible accounts, $15,000. Don't debit bad debt expense. We already did last year. We estimated for this. We stored that estimate in the allowance for uncollectible accounts. And this looks like a mistake in here, but uh, that's okay. So we could see how we got our accounts receivable balance. I think the other account was supposed to be our allowance for uncollectibles. So that would have left us. We started with a credit balance in the allowance for uncollectibles of 25,000. 15,000 was just written off. So that's where that $10,000 credit balance in the bottom T account for the allowance for uncollectible accounts came from. What do we do if an account we previously wrote off as uncollectible, we receive the money? Do we just send it back and say, sorry, we already wrote off your account? No. Occasionally a receivable that has been written off is later reinstated. When this happens, the first thing we do is debit accounts receivable for the amount and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. We just reversed the write-off. When we thought it was bad, we wrote it off, debiting allowance for uncollectibles, crediting accounts receivable. Well, it isn't bad, so we've got to reverse it. Then record the cash coming in. Debit cash, credit accounts receivable. Now, how do we come up with these estimates? As I said, we don't usually start picking apart every customer on our customer list, right? So there's a couple different approaches to finding that dollar amount of estimate. And the first one they're talking about here is the balance sheet approach. So the company estimates what the ending balance of the allowance for uncollectible accounts should be, and then records a journal entry to get it to that balance. And they usually use accounts receivable um, to do that. Now, the current expected credit loss model is estimates, estimates should consider all receivables and be based on all relevant information, 
historical experience, current conditions, reasonable and supportable forecasts. And you have to use this method starting in 2020. So now I guess we will start analyzing each customer account. Applying an estimate of the percentage of bad debt to the entire outstanding receivable balance and applying different percentages to accounts receivable balance depending on the length of time outstanding. So this is a special model that will need to be used in the future under the balance sheet approach. Currently, we usually use the aging of accounts receivables to determine this estimate. Now you could see that report in front of you. Let's make sure you understand it. An aging of accounts receivables is just a report of accounts receivables. Okay, it's usually done as of a certain date. So you could see there it's 12-31-2021. And that very first column shows all of our customers. So it's going to list each customer the total amount they owe. And take a look at the bottom. The total is 305000 and that's the current balance in accounts receivable. What it then does is take each invoice each customer owes and ages it. So if this sale or if this credit amount occurred in the last 60 days before December 31st and is still owed to us, the balance will be in the zero to 60 day column. If the sale occurred 61 to 90 days ago, it will be in that column. If the sale occurred 91 to 120 days ago that the customer still owes us the money, then it's accordingly in that column. So it ages out the accounts receivable balance. It just isn't 305,000. Now we know 220,000 of it, 1,000 of it is very new. It only happened in the past 60 days. 50,000 of it is 61 to 90 days. So it's getting a little older. 25,000 of it is like three to four months old. And 10,000 of it is over four months old. What we do is we do a calculation based on those totals. So every age group is not expected to go bad the same way. So in other words, um, very new accounts receivables, there's going to be less of, of a percentage of them that will go bad. So this company, based on past experience, current conditions, feels 5% of them will go bad. Of the ones in the 61 to 90 days, they're getting a little older. So now they feel that 10% of that category will go bad. The 91 to 120 days, 20% of those, and 40% of the amounts in the over four months. That's a little low, actually usually a little bit higher for that old of an invoice. So you can see as accounts receivables get older, it's less likely you're going to collect them so the estimate for uncollectible accounts becomes higher. So we multiply each age group's total by the expected amount, not ex um, the percentage that is not expected to be collected. So the zero to 60 days, $11,000 of that category. 61 to 90 days, 5,000 of that category. 5,000 of the 91 to 120 and then over 120 for grand. So that's just telling us the amount of each category that's estimated not to be collected. We want to know an overall number, so add them up. So this is one way for estimating the balance for your allowance for uncollectible accounts. And when you use accounts receivables to estimate, that's what you're determining, what the new balance must be in the allowance for uncollectible accounts once you make your journal entry. So at the end of 2022, Hawthorne has gross accounts receivable balance of 400,000, but it believes it will only collect 360. So they need a balance of 40,000. So they went through like that aging process that we just did and their number instead of being 25 was 40. Right now, the current balance in the uncollectible before the adjustment is a credit of 11,200. Remember the allowance for uncollectible accounts is a contra asset, so it must have a credit balance in it. So we need to get its balance from 11,200 credit to a $40,000 credit. So we will debit bad debt expense in 2022, 28,800, 
and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts, 28800 Now, what if instead Hawthorne's allowance for uncollectible accounts at the end of 2022 had a debit balance of $2,000? Wow. Well, why would that happen? We wrote off more bad accounts, actual bad accounts, than we estimated for. Remember, the estimate goes on the credit side. The debit side is um, what we have to do when there's an actual bad account during the year. So that happens. The point is, is that you have to get it from a debit balance of $2,000 to a $40,000 credit balance at the end of the year. So you'll credit it for $42,000. So you'll debit accounts, or I'm sorry, you'll debit bad debt expense, 42000 credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. Final scenario. What if the balance in the allowance for uncollectible accounts is a credit of 11200 and you've determined as of the end of the year it should be a credit balance of 5000 Now you have to debit the allowance for uncollectible accounts, the difference, and credit bad debt expense. So you do whatever you need to do to get that allowance for uncollectible accounts to the estimated balance it should be at the end of the year and do the opposite to bad debt expense. That's one way of estimating. Another way of estimating, which isn't as popular, is using a percentage of your credit sales. So it's an income statement approach where you're saying, here's how much of my sales I don't expect to collect in the future. That's how much you debit bad debt expense for and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. It's very straightforward and easy, but it's not as accurate as using accounts receivable. So if Hawthorne had sales of 1.2 million and estimated that 2% of those sales would prove uncollectible, it would debit bad debt expense 24 grand and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. It doesn't matter. We don't focus on what's the balance in the allowance for uncollectible accounts on the income statement approach. So a lot of companies will do exactly what they're talking about here. They will use the income statement approach during the year to estimate bad debt expense. So Hawthorne can estimate bad debt expense on a quarterly basis using the income statement approach just to get something recorded as bad debt expense as they're making financial statements during the year. But at the end of the year, they'll use the balance sheet approach for that final estimated amount so that their allowance for uncollectible accounts truly reflects the um, amount of accounts receivables not expected to be collected in the future. So Berkeley Associates uses the balance sheet approach to estimate bad debt. It started 2021 with a credit balance of 10,000 in its allowance for uncollectible accounts. It wrote off 200,000 of bad debts during 2021. So that means it started with a credit balance of 10,000, debited it for 200,000, and its aging of accounts receivable indicates it should have a credit balance of 5,000. Wow. So 10,000 was the starting point. 200,000 was the debit. So they really underestimated for bad debts last year. And they expected to have a $5,000 balance at the end of this year. So what are we going to do? Debit bad debt expense, 195,000. Credit the allowance for bad debts, 195000 To get it from its current balance of um, a debit of 190000 to its required balance of a credit of 5000 And you could do that through a T account. And there's the journal entry and the computation there. So finally, with accounts receivables, um, when, when do we recognize them? Well, it depends on the revenue recognition. Basically, it's when we either provide the product or the service. That's when we'll record an accounts receivable. 
What's the initial valuation? It's the amount we expect to collect. Remember, it could be affected by cash discounts, sales discounts, sales returns. What about subsequent valuation? Well, the initial valuation is reduced by any allowance for uncollectible accounts. So it's reduced for the, the total balance of accounts receivable is reduced for the amount of accounts receivable not expected to be collected in the future. And it's the net or net realizable value that is actually reported. This is the amount of cash we expect to receive. It's always classified, almost always, as a current asset. Okay, so again, starting in 2020, companies will be required to use the CECL current expected credit loss model to account for bad debts. It's designed to give a more accurate and forward looking estimate of bad debt expense. It uses the allowance method and the same journal entries, but it differs from current gap in two important ways. One, the probable threshold for identifying bad debts is removed and two, while current practice tends to focus on events that already have occurred when considering potential bad debts, this new model explicitly requires us to consider additional information such as reasonable and supportable forecasts about the future. So we're looking at the economy and we're trying to um, be a better forecaster with regards to these bad debts. Okay, so that's the end of part one of our discussion. I will be getting together part two.